to the one who defies every metaphor. We say thank you. Okay. We invite your presence, the presence of our ancestors, the presence of all freedom-loving people into this space. Let us learn something new, teach something new, be open to something new. And so it is. Almighty Creator, we gather in this place today to remember and to celebrate that the dream is very much alive. We celebrate the organization that has always been a part of us. And as we eat today, we ask that you bless the food to the nourishment of our bodies, and you most certainly Bless the hands that have prepared it. More than anything else, oh God, remind us that what we have in this room is your gift to us. In the name of the one who created us all, let us say, Asher. From the beginning of that time, Reverend Orange kind of assigned me to the LGBT community. Uh, two of the first people I met was um, two gentlemen that came in, and we sit down and we talked and we talked about, okay, well, what do we want from the LGBT community? Where do we want them in the march? And the whole gamut. So we kind of set the foundation for what we have here today. Now, one of the things that we we'll understand is that, just like Craig just said, Reverend Orange had one, one theory. There are no outsiders when it came to the market, okay? So we didn't have anybody that came on with it, any type of attitude that it, it was nothing but all inclusive. The LGBT community has been one of the major forces in the market, okay? We wouldn't think of doing it without you. Mm -hmm. And also, we want to thank you for all of the years that you have stood by us. One year, it was so cold out there that the people in the church didn't even want to come up to the front line. But when we turned around, the LGB community was coming out of buildings and out of cracks and everything, and we made it happen. So on behalf of the March Committee, I would like to thank you all for your participation, your continued participation, and we look to see you year after year after year. So, uh, Big Sister Darlene, uh, Craig, Kirk Surgeon, all the people that we know we work with on a daily basis, thank you so much. Let's keep it going. How many of y'all have been to the breakfast before? Amazing, amazing. Okay, how many have been to two or more breakfasts? All right. Michael, blow his neck. Three or more? All right, all right. Four or more? Wow, y'all are more than five. How about that? All right. First timers, thank you. First timers. So as you can see, this event has grown and it continues to grow, and we thank you so much because you're the ones that have made it grow. You're the ones that have made it possible. Just over the years that you've invested in it. You know, when we started, we had a small room of folks and a little pot of coffee. <laughs> and those of y'all who know me know that that will not do. So, the coffee part, anyway. But uh, we have grown, and we have you to thank, as well as our promotional partners. So thank you again. We're about to get started, all right? All right.
gauntlet band-aids and bleed out that they are killing the black body. We, we start genocide! For Mike Brown, S.A. Nettle, Ranisha McBride, Troy Davis, Rakia Boyd, Dewana Johnson, Eric Lewater,
thank you to the people who are managing the kids going over there. To Jackie and all the volunteers, thank you so much. Because the children are precious. The young people are precious. And it is so important that we begin and continue to plant those seeds of peace and justice within their little hearts. Did y'all see the little baby come here? Ten. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you so much. Now here's Fred. Uh, my sister. On behalf of the Rustin Lord Planning Group, we welcome you in love to the 2015 by Rustin Audrey Lord Breakfast. Woo! Space, the Loud Mill Center. We're so glad. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we started in 2002 with some good hot food and one earned a coffee and about 45 people. And over the next 14 years, y'all have made this what it's become. So, as Donnie mentioned, thank you to the sponsors, the volunteers, and of course, all of y'all, the hundreds of attendees that make this what it is. And please know that this act of honoring our black LGBT legends in the land of this stuff is correct. Before that, we had the Five Rustin Rider. How many of y'all know about that? Started by leaders like Duncan T. Uh, Charlie Cosley, Bishop Mahi, Malakani Mahi, uh, and Tony Daines. Our beloved brother, brother Tony Daines, yes. And others that affirm by Rustin, that brilliant civil rights architect, mentor to Dr. King, and chief organizer of the 1963 March on Washington. There was also Zammy. How many of y'all know about Zammy? <laughs> amazing black lesbian organization spearheaded by sister Mary Ann Adams, who celebrated, yes, who celebrated uh, Audre Lorde, that incredible black lesbian feminist poet writer, organizer, teacher, and poet laureate of New York State. The Rustin Lord Breakfast continues the tradition so that we know where we came from and whose lineage we belong to. We commemorate our ancestors, sacred histories, and our precious memories. The breakfast also affirms us, the work that we're doing today, and fortifies us for the long road ahead. There are people in this room today who organize transgender vigils, vigils. They present workshops, they build youth coalitions and intergenerational black gay men's dialogues and attend leadership conferences and speak out HIV campaigns for youth Woo! advocacy. Yes, and as Byron Rustin encouraged, they put their bodies in places so that wheels don't turn. There are people at your table whose act of resistance consists of walking to that martyr station in the daylight or just raising a family or choosing between an HIV bed and a meal, or just making a way to keep on keeping on. We live in a land where black and queer bodies can still be found hanging from the poplar trees. Whether that's in Ferguson, Staten Island, Sanford, Florida, or Atlanta, Georgia. So the human cost of our work and our daily lives outweighs any dollar pay. You know, there's a song by, by Sweet Honey Rock and I love the part where she says, um, making a way out of no way is flesh out of flesh. It ain't fair. But someone have to make a way out of no way. That's flesh out of flesh and it costs. So considering this, we chose to continue with the theme, Justice, Freedom, and Desire, a homecoming, as it is no less relevant in 2015 because we declare black lives matter. Black transgender lives matter. Black gay bisexual lives matter. Black women's lives matter. All lives matter. Not just those that are valued by a white supremacist patriarchy. We commit to justice that upends the status quo, not just for the most privileged or heteronormative among us. Our right to vote, our freedom against uh, discrimination and racial and gender profiling were all on the chopping block. The freedom to express ourselves, to dress and speak and act as we will, to love and marry who we want, maintains and needs our continued defense, our vigilant defense. We celebrate our desire. We celebrate and honor desire, right? That drive to live our lives uh, fully, to set our own goals, to feel joy, to receive pleasure and give pleasure to others, and our willingness to fight and to die for it. We celebrate that because you know what? That's what freedom demands. 
we celebrate desire. And so we, we want you to consider the breakfast as a homecoming, because that's what it is. It reunites us as an extended family. It also sets us to confront each other and ourselves and our community, including our divisions, our own divisions of racism and sexism and classism and transphobia. And ultimately, it offers us an opportunity for healing. So like I said, a way out of no way requires healing. And a lot of us, that's what we do every day, just waking up in the morning, going to that martyr station. So we're going to focus on healing as a human right, as an activist strategy, and as a personal need. Several of today's speakers in the Fishbowl discussion will be talking about their experiences with healing. And so we invite you to share yours. Talk about your healing path to people at your table, particularly those who you might not know. All right. So I want you to share what gets in the way of your healing and also what, mm, what lubricates that path. What and who lubricates your healing? Y'all know what I mean. Y'all know what I mean. All right now. I'll let y'all clean that for yourself. All right. Lubricate your path. Yeah. All right. You gotta be lubricated. This is your breakfast. This is your breakfast. So we invite you to listen, to learn, to be willing to be open to being challenged or even made somewhat uncomfortable. Take it all in. We know you can take it. That's why we're giving it to you. Ooh. All right. That's it. We want you to get it. We want you to get it. We want you to get it to feel good. The breakfast is about more than what's on your plate. So enjoy the feast. Thank you. We love you. Thank you. We are going to introduce <laughs> Representative Simone Bell to the stage. Yeah. So just walk in. Yeah. Representative Simone. Hey y'all, what's up? Y'all know they wrong to have a show. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. by to say hey because y'all know it's a lot going on in case y'all didn't know that y'all heard what happened this week at the capitol right some stuff went down with this religious freedom bill so i'm just here to remind you all that we must stay on the battlefield we have religious freedom bills that are going forth we have education bills that are going forth we have transportation bills that are going forth they're trying to take away insurance coverage for school bus drivers and cafeteria workers so please 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 Stay connected to what's going on here in Georgia. I know a lot of times we get excited about what's going on across the country, but the real deal is it's happening right down the street here as well. So thank you all so much for the work that you do. A lot of you have been on this battlefield a long time. I am so excited for our young people. Y'all march because my feet hurt, but I'm there with y'all. And just thank you so much for all the love and for the support. And just keep in mind, no matter what happens in the state of Georgia, you do have someone who's representing your best interests at the moment. I love you and I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who is an amazing, uh, has just such uh, an incredible history and body of contributing to our community as a true leader and as a, a black gay man, a fellow black gay man that makes me proud to be a black gay man. Whether it's through his work with the CDC or his current work in, at Gilead. I remember Rashad at the Black Gay Lesbian Leadership Forum when he was a youngin', and I knew that there was going to be some power and some change to come. I knew he was a, what five of us might call an angelic troublemaker. And here he is. Rashad. I will see the mic to Simone any day. It's uh, such a pleasure to, to be here. And I must, I would ask that everyone uh, put their forks down and let's give a huge round of applause to Darlene and Craig for their
Now you can you can have all of the sponsors lined up, and you can have the people willing to do the work. But every movement requires leaders and visionaries, and it is an honor to be able to be a part of what you two need. So thank you so so much. Thank you. I'm Rashad Burgess. I'm a community liaison with Gilead Sciences, and part of what I do and my job here is work with many organizations, health department. Uh, community health centers and a host of other entities and providing education and support around HIV. Our bottom line at Gilead Science is we want to ensure that everyone who is living with HIV um, has the ability to be biologically suppressed and if everyone who is working to prevent HIV, we help in providing the tools to be able to do that. And so that is part of my role. So I'm very honored today to be able to bring up one of the speakers that we have as part of our portfolio. And uh, she is home. She is here in Atlanta, Georgia at the Fulton County Health Department. She's the only doctor I know that walks into the room and her patients clap. And so um, she has been a long time provider of HIV care for over 20 years. And so I will present to you the lead physician at Fulton County Health Department, Dr. Eden Biggers. First of all, thank you so much. Rashad Burgess, thank you so much for inviting me. And, and, and as well as Darlene, Craig, I'm just so honored, first of all, to be here in the midst of all of you. Thank you for the young folks who came up and told us that we have got to win, okay? Let me, let me just say a few things about being an activist and the importance of it, especially as we celebrate Dr. King's birthday, okay? This is a, um, I just got a t-shirt from AHF that says um, AIDS is a, gosh, I have blank. A civil rights issue, thank you. Of all things to blank on, okay? Don't hold that against me. AIDS is a civil rights issue, okay? I've been taking care of people living with HIV for the last 20 years at the Fulton County Department of Health and Wellness, the health department. I take care of people who are uninsured or who have Medicare and Medicaid. Now. Let me tell you what a revolutionary act is that I need all of you to do. The next time the Ryan White Act comes up for appropriation, okay, I need all of you, all of you, to get in touch with somebody, in some representative, all the representatives, okay, whether you do it by email, whether you do it by phone, Facebook, social media of any kind. We cannot lose that. Somebody just said something about having to choose between taking a pill and eating. That is ridiculous in this country. That is absolutely ridiculous. Think about that. So we cannot lose this Ryan White Care Act because it takes care of people throughout the country who have HIV and who are uninsured. That's very, very important, very important. Keep that in mind, please. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about HIV, okay? Um, and when Rashad asked me to talk about HIV in, okay, where's Maurice? Maurice, if I need help, help me out, okay? Um, when Maurice asked me to talk about HIV in African American community, I started thinking, okay, now how am I gonna do this? How, how best to approach it? because I know all of you know how HIV is transmitted. I'm gonna just do a little historical thing, not, not very much. But what I want you to think about is, again, here we are celebrating Dr. King's birthday. We are our brothers and our sisters keepers. Are we not? Yes. Are we? Yes. And see, that has some far-reaching consequences because what is one of the first things that my patients tell me, and we, we have the largest, we have the largest testing site in Georgia. I, most of my patients are black gay men, okay? But one of the first things that sticks with me is I have a young man, a young woman, one of my folks, 
all of my folks who sit across from me, look me straight in the eye and say, someone gave me HIV because they lied, right? Now that's not being our brothers and sisters keepers. Y'all too quiet, would you agree? Yes. Or not? Now certainly we have personal responsibility to protect ourselves, but we also have responsibility to tell the truth. All right, so let's talk a little bit about HIV in our community, okay? Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the timeline and just bring out a couple of... Uh, uh, Maurice is not doing anything. All right, I'll, I'll figure this out. All right, so 1981, the first seven cases Oh, there it is. Okay, the first seven cases of what we now call AIDS are reported. And two of these cases are black people. Wouldn't it be nice if we only had two cases now? Huh? Two of those black. Well, absolutely, absolutely. 1982, there were 86 HIV cases in us, in black, in black people. One out of every five cases. Then we get to 1987, and the first medication for HIV was approved, antiretroviral, it was called AZT, retrovirus, zidovudine, and it was the first one approved by the FDA. 1991, Magic Johnson was diagnosed with HIV. Now, how many of you have ever heard Magic Johnson say that he was cured? Wow, okay, that was something that he said in error. Right. And but it follows him to this day. All right, so that was 91, 92, salt and pepper, hip hop salt and pepper, really started talking about AIDS. They had a song called Let's Talk About AIDS, and that was opening the door for dialogue about safer sex, HIV, AIDS, and other STIs. And in 1993, now this was historic, AIDS was the, HIV was the leading cause of death for black men, 25 to 44, and the second leading cause of death for black women. And that hasn't really changed a whole lot. And at that, in that year, the tennis great Arthur Ashe died. All right, let's do some more days. All right, so 1994, there was the first black woman on the cover of Essence with HIV, her name was Ray Lewis Thornton. And this, I mean, this was pretty historic. In 1994, imagine being out with HIV. Just incredible. 1995, Easy e Anybody remember Easy e Y'all know who Easy e was? Easy e was a rapper. A rapper who died of HIV. Okay. So then, right around the time of the Olympics in Atlanta, we got our first medicine, um, the protease inhibitors, and they really made a big difference in the way that HIV was, was, was treated. All right, 1997, we had the first fixed dose combination of HIV, and what that is is, you know, you know sometimes people don't appreciate just what people with HIV go through on a daily basis. At the beginning, it was necessary to take three different medications, okay? And sometimes those three different medications were a lot of pills. Sometimes they were as many as 20 pills. So that was a big deal in 97 for the first fixed dose combination. All three medications in one pill, it was called, called a trip. All right. Let's go on down to 2003, we get another new class of medicines, fusion inhibitors, and this was an injectable. 2007, did anybody see Queen Latifah in playing a woman living with HIV and AIDS? Okay, that, 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 was, that was just an incredible film. All right, now today we have more than 560,000 black Americans living with HIV. Okay, some of those folks are living well with HIV, and a lot of those folks are not living well at all. Let me tell you why. We as black people have the highest, we are of all comers, no matter what we're talking about. If we're talking about 
men, women, everyone, children, we're at the top. So we are at the top, so keep that in mind. HIV affects black people more than any other racial group in this country. So look at this, about 14 out of 100 people in the United States are black, but 44 out of 100 people, black people are diagnosed. That's quite a, that's quite a big disparity. That's, oh, wait a minute, hold on. My slides are not keeping up with what I'm saying. Okay, 44 out of 100 people diagnosed with HIV and this was data from 2010, were black. That's 44%. So that's quite a bit. That's a comparison of 14% versus 44%. In other words, we're overrepresented, right? Okay, so the question is, why is that? Why are HIV rates higher in our community? I mean, what are, what are some of the factors? Well, one thing that comes really to the forefront in my clinic is late diagnosis. And what that actually means is we get a lot of people whose, an AIDS diagnosis means that you have a T cell count that is less than 200. Okay, so a T cell count in a person who's HIV negative is usually over 500. It's not really a test that we do unless a person is HIV positive. Okay, so if you get a person who's newly diagnosed coming in with a T-cell count of two, what that means is that they have been diagnosed late in the infection. And that happens quite a bit in our community. <coughs> Other reasons, lack of reliable treatment and lack of reliable information about HIV prevention. You know, we love to have sex, but we don't, we don't want to talk about it. Anybody ever think about that? So what do we ask our partners or potential partners, potential sex partners? What do we ask? Do we ask any questions? Do we want to know anything? Do we ever ask if they've been tested? Have we been tested, first of all? Do we know our status? Okay. Do we know our status after we've been tested or do we just think, oh, well, I can't possibly be HIV positive, right? Because let me tell you, HIV looks like all of us, right? It looks like all of us. And it's an equal opportunity and factor. So some of the other reasons that are, are often said is that we have higher levels of other STIs, sexually transmitted infections, and those make it easier for us to get HIV. Let's talk about stigma. What about stigma? Is there stigma around being HIV positive? Yes. Stigma. We are 30, 30 plus years into the epidemic, and the stigma now is probably as great as it ever was. We have more than 30 medications to treat HIV, and the stigma is, is still there. And then lack of awareness of our status, again, lack of awareness of our status personally, lack of awareness of our partners or potential partner status. So who's at the top in terms of who gets infected more? Young MSNs. You're fired. Huh? Transgender folks who are invisible. Trans Transgender. Transgender. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Once again, and I have lots of trans women in my clinic. And Cheryl is exactly right, because the CDC is just starting to study and look at trans women, and not on the radar as, as they should be. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Pendleton. Thank you. I only have a couple of minutes, and I want y'all to ask me some questions, okay? Anything that you've been thinking about, anything that you need to ask? And one thing I, I want all of you to think about is how are we going to stop ignoring our brothers and sisters? Okay. Yes? Because he had money. Because he had money. Oh, there are plenty of people with money who who don't do the right thing. I get what you I get what you're saying. Um, Magic Johnson takes the same medication as anybody else. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of people think that he has a rainforest in his backyard, that sort of thing. He takes the same meds as everybody else. Hi. Okay, I, I didn't hear the last part of it. Okay, um, Dick Gregory said that, um, what's his name, um, Magic Johnson never actually had HIV, and so he was caught at any point, and therefore he didn't get out of the NBA. He tried to come back, and that's when Carl Malone said, oh, I don't want to play with somebody who's dating, so then, you know, he tried to say he was cured, but there's no cure, so like, nothing playing around with him. Actually, the reason that he, that business about him being cured, he had a test called a viral load, which your goal with the viral, viral load tells you how much virus is in your body. Your goal is for it to be undetectable. That's not the same as being cured. Well, um, one more question. Um, with the CDC and other normal health, uh, public health institutions, um, are they involved with helping you guys and advocating? I just find it difficult that they're helping everybody else in the world and trying to get their ideas part of the process for helping them out. Yes, yes they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the, question, the question is, is the CDC helping us in any way? Absolutely. Yes. Um, I think my time has come to an end. Listen, I want, again, we cannot afford to have anybody be invisible. Right. Our trans brothers and sisters, all of us, all of us count and all of our lives matter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Smith. At this time, we're gonna begin our fishbowl discussion. Atlanta HIV AIDS educator, research coordinator, national community-based worker, Reverend Duncan T. recently joined Georgia E. Colley as the Faith Outreach Consultant this fall. Universalist Congregation of Atlanta and completed credentials for the UU's Association. The Auburn Avenue Research Library is in charge. Mary Hooks is a campaign organizer with Southerners on New Ground. Song. Song is a 22-year-old grassroots organization that centers the lives of Black and Latino LGBTQ people in the South. With over 250, 200, 200, excuse me, 2,500 members and supporters, Song has been on organizing in Atlanta to stop deportations with the Not One More Coalition, supporting the Solutions Not Punishment Staff Coalition, and with the Shut It Down Atlanta. <laughs> to address police and state sanctioned violence and is part of the Black Lives Matter Network. She is a dangerous homosexual. <laughs> she is a dangerous homosexual mother and partner 
who loves in this community. Yeah. Next to Mary is Ariel Marie. Mar Ariel. Ariel. Awesome. Ariel. 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 Ariel Marie is a spoken word artist and founder of It's Bigger Than You. organization dedicated to fighting the systematic and institutionalized war on black and brown bodies through hashtag it's bigger than you young people have answered the call for radical resistance her work as a teaching artist have carried her to harvard nyu and the tupac shakur center for arts as a queer woman l uses her voice and body as a vessel for the movement work be it behind a mic or megaphone all right thank you Next to Elle is Mikhail. Oh, Mikhail Bradford, Mickey. Woo! Yeah. 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 Work battle yeah. 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 Mickey currently serves as a linkage to HIV care yeah. navigator for a local healthcare agency. He is an ambassador for Greater Than AIDS. Hashtag Speak Out campaign. Ow! Woo! And the 2014 National Minority AIDS Council Youth Scholar. Woo! Mickey also works on capacity building for nonprofits as a founding member of the Atlanta Coalition for LGBT Youth. He is a director, he's a direct action organizer and a co-founder of Atlanta Queer and Trans People of Color Collective and the Southern Fried Queer Pride Festival. Yeah. These bright lights have me sweating. <laughs> I'm not used to this outside of my bedroom. <laughs> but these are our fishbowl participants. We have some questions on our screen that I will be reading and that they will be answering. So we'll get right into it. <clears throat> this fishbowl is about liberation and healing. And like I said, you can tune in here and here. This will be what I'm reading. So thank you for being with us today. All right. Now, we're really trying to hit home on what it means, not just to resist, okay, but how we heal when we resist. And this is, this is the key important as to why we chose these individuals here today. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin, and we'll start on the end with you, Duncan, and we'll bring it towards me. And let's, let's talk about, tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do and what you do done in the community. I'm, I'm Reverend Duncan Teague as of September. Uh, All right, so about 20 plus years of HIV and AIDS work from passing out condoms to working in research and actually helping with the PrEP study um, became my acceptance that I in fact had been doing ministry and I need to get paid, so you gotta you know, go to school and stuff. So since 08, I've been in ministerial formation and it culminated in a really grand ordination ceremony in September. Um, and while I was healing from prostate cancer, yes, I'm coming out of that. Yeah. Um, so I wanna talk to the guys who are over 40 as another time. But let your doctor get intimate with you. All right. Uh, because I am a survivor. My test results as of this week said I don't have prostate cancer. Yeah. And, and because the work doesn't stop, I, I thought it could wait at least until I got healed from my surgery. But Georgia Equality and Freedom to Marry started courting me. I'm old, so you have to come with some money. <laughs> While I was in recuperation, and they said, we need somebody to talk to faith leaders about freedom to marry, because it's coming. Yes, it is. And, it's, and there's some backlash coming, too. Be clear, be very clear, y'all that this religious liberty stuff is because somebody is mad yes, that y'all gonna be able to marry legally <laughs> yeah, right. in the state of Georgia. Yeah. 
for keep the ears and eyes open, so that's what I'm doing now. And, and then, of course, there were a few days when I did some art with one of the tall, big, pretty men in the room. Uh, and, and I'm talking about one this time, not many. Uh, as a Jody Muse. And, I, and I'm promising that as a minister and activist that I have not dropped artists. Well, hello, friends. Uh, again, my name is Mary Hooks. I'm with Southerners on New Ground. It's a uh, pleasure to be in this space. Um, and I'll keep it very brief because I know Ash will get all turned up if I don't. So, um, essentially, uh, the question being, uh, what have I done in our community? Everything! Kidding. <laughs> no, joking. Really joking. But I do know a lot of folks who are doing a lot of amazing things, and they're out here, and this is. You know, this room is filled with uh, organizers and folks and members of song and supporters of song and folks who just love and want liberation for our people. And so that's, yeah. and founders of song, Pat Hussein is in the room. Yeah. Um, in the beginning said Atlanta has too much infrastructure. Atlanta actually doesn't have a great need. We should be extending ourselves to those places in the south, you know, that does not look like Atlanta. Um, however, over the last few years, especially with the immigration fight coming here, yes. and with uh, our membership being so hardcore, you know, we're like, hey, we actually do need to be moving work in Atlanta. So over the last uh, few years, um, doing the immigration work has been amazing and we're doing that within coalition alliances among our sister organizations, the George Latino uh, Alliance uh, for Human Rights, GLAR, and um, recently uh, the latest fight with the immigration work has been around stopping uh, the police and uh, ICE collaboration in our community and trying to limit the deportations that is happening out of Georgia. And um, over the last few months, We've also, I think everyone, August 19th was one of those moments, again, where the eyes of our understanding became open and the consciousness of folks, um, you know, was open. And so, as movement folks, we know, yo, when we have a moment and people are in the streets, you get in the streets, you know what I mean? And, you, and, you, and it's our responsibility and challenge to begin form work and create um, strategies and actual campaign works and fights that's worthy of our people's time, resources, dignity, and courage. And so we've been trying to do that with um, organizations like It's Bigger Than You, you know, working with SNAPCO and supporting the amazing work that they're doing at East Point and here in the city of Atlanta. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm stop before I get your mic sense. <laughs> Mary told me we got our own mic, she's not scared today. Um, peace family, how is everybody? Uh, how is everybody? Oh we need to do it with some artistic and collective folks, like we need to be warm and vibing and all intimate and stuff. Okay, so um, I'm so um, humbled to be the baby uh, on stage. I've been the baby in a lot of spaces for the past couple of months. And it's been great and it's been transformative and really eye-opening and encouraging. Um, my name is Ariel Marie, and I'm the founder of Hashtag It's Bigger Than You. Um, and we've been doing movement work um, since August surrounding police brutality, and not just police brutality, but also state sanctioned violence against um, black and brown bodies, specifically black women and, and, and black men and, and brown women and brown men, and, and especially inclusive of queer and trans bodies in that work. And um, making sure that queer and trans bodies are included in the fight for justice and make sure that that narrative isn't taken from us and isn't um, excluded out of the conversation. Um, and so, in this work, um, and so that's been um, what I what I feel like my my platform has been in the past couple of months. Um, I 
definitely chose to um, come out while we were um, organizing in the streets of Atlanta, and that was like, what, as a radically visible queer woman, what is your role now? It is to make sure that young people are marching in the streets for um, Michael Brown and also marching in the streets for Kim Jones and making sure that this conversation is inclusive and making sure that it is um, holistic in nature. Um, and so uh, we've also been in, in coalition with um, Southerners on New Ground with um, MXGM and Gen Y Project. Um, we've done everything from shutting down the highway to making sure that um, is here to uh, placate us and, and, and stop these conversations. And um, it was real cute of him to come after 26% uh, of Black Friday sales dropped. So that was good enough, right? Um, so, and we've been in cahoots with Ferguson organizers, um, with organizers in Chicago, um, with organizers in New York and Oakland and the Dream Defenders in Florida, making sure that this conversation is nationally recognized and that we do movement work to back up the words that we all cue and talking with. Um, I'm also a spoken word artist and that is a big part of why I'm here. Before I was doing movement work in August, I was making sure that um, spaces were created for young people to be uh, to take hold of their narratives and create uh, an anthology of what their black was and what their brown was, and um, add this anthology to conversations happening around the country. Um, and I've been teaching at Harvard, uh, NYU, uh, UGA, um, and a couple other institutions um, all over the country. Um, and this year, I was blessed to be one of Creative Loafing's 20 People to Watch for 2015 um, for yeah. the Art Award. Yeah. Um, for activism work as well as artistry. And artistry is a big part of who I am because it is um, often a megaphone for conversations and often a platform for us to kind of share um, our, our, our circles and share our <coughs> backgrounds and, and share pieces of ourselves and keep them with one another. And um, in the ideology of shared space, that's been a big part of uh, why I'm here and why I continue to work. So I'm to be here. Thank you. That was a lot longer than 30 yes. minutes. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Being generous. <laughs> I'm going to keep this short. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, so this is just something I got to do just to still my nerves. I am the Mickey B. Sometimes you got to say that just to remind yourself who the hell you are. Um, and I'll, I'll say how do I want to convey the work that I've done? Um, how many folks have been to Aid Atlanta or the Evolution Project? Raise your hands. Or Shout Out or Mercy Care. How many folks have seen a Speak Out HIV video? How many folks have worked with Snapco? How many folks have been to the Sweet Tea Variety Show? How many folks have participated in World AIDS Day? That's the work that I've done. I've supported each and every one of these organizations, each and every one of these events. Um, I, I fill the gaps that are necessary. I do what is needed to be done. Um, when Ash introduced me, you heard a lot of co-founding, um, co-facilitating, co-curating, all of these things. I believe in collective power. I believe that we are all in this together. I believe that this is not about me. This is about all of us. This is about doing the work that not only transforms our communities, but transforms us. Work that not only heals our communities, but heals us. And so, largely the work that I've been doing has been around uh, HIV um, because of the alarming statistics around uh, black gay men. Largely, the work that I've been doing has been around art and performance because the girls want to see us twirl <laughs> and have this power. And so now, um, I'm going to be calling on so many folks in this room uh, to help me culminate all of those things into one um, event of resistance, Southern Fried Queer Pride Festival, happening this June here in Atlanta. Following in the footsteps of Mondo Homo. How many folks remember Mondo Homo? And 
I'm going to need each and every one of you to participate in that. And so I just wanted to say that also to lift up the, uh, the idea that you don't have to be necessarily a part of these organizations. You don't necessarily have to have your own, you know, I am the da 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 da. I got these initials following after my name and I've done this, this, and that. Girl, just show up. Stand in your truth. Stand in your power. Stand in your pumps.
Um, and here in Atlanta, uh, we began, uh, <laughs> we shut down the highway, or the members of the song shut down the highway, and, um, you know, began to, 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 to bring light and attention to what was actually happening here, that we know the conditions that set off Ferguson are the same conditions that we rough it, tough it, and deal with every day. I know um, for myself it really hit home because in April I experienced um, violence at the hands of the police, at the uh, College Park police when I was uh, simply telling someone that they didn't have to speak to the police and they didn't have to have their vehicle searched. And then I was uh, then given charges, arrested, um, came out with a, a, a fractured elbow, etc., etc. Um, literally attacked for telling and trying to expand this uh, concept of democracy. And so when it happened in um, August, I was still holding that. And I think um, working under, working with song and doing this work has actually been where I found my power and my being able to um, confront power in a very real way, in a very real way that I can taste it. What I couldn't say on April 14th, what I wanted to say, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to swing back, I get to do that in a way that I know is going to move mountains for our people. Amen. And do it in a way that's going to impact and build our collective liberation. And I just have to give a shout out to a lot of you all in the room who supported me through that. And it's, a, it's a, I think, a good audience to say thank you. Because this is what it means to be held by your community. This is what it means, you know, to have support. And another way that has been awesome is through the uh, through the queer folks of color who have been putting together healing salons, you know, has just been uh, incredible, incredible. And finding, I think what's, what's amazing about this moment is that everyone has a role and a part to play, you know, through whether it be queer fit and getting us physically ready to get on the front line. I got some squats to do today, you know. Push ups, push ups today. Together. You know, but this is all of this is all of our struggle, and this will be all of our victory. And if we treat it as such, and we own it as such, and play our roles in it, we heal each other in the process. And being able to confront power, and be able to go to the power holders and say, "This is what we want, and this is how we want it," is amazing and healing within itself. So that's been my experience. Well, um, so Audre Lord calls a system that we live under the white supremacist capitalism, patri white supremacist patriarchy capitalism system. I'm gonna get it. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's okay. I didn't go to sleep till 7 a.m. Y'all, nope. I have my right to be raggedy. This is my one raggedy moment, right? And we're gonna move forward. I love y'all. Um, so. We live under a system that's like intersectional uh, of, a, of a lot of different issues. And we sit at like the intersection of many different oppressions as queer, black, and brown bodies and um, as, as people living in America. Um, and in Atlanta, um, I've noticed that we often think that we are um, exempt um, from a lot of the issues that happen in other worlds. So when we're organizing um, around these issues, um, dealing with police brutality after post post Ferguson and post Cleveland and, and post Oakland, um, a lot of people, a lot of young people were like, well, you know, APD doesn't mess with me. You know, APD is not as bad as Ferguson PD. And we forget how many um, bodies have been victims of, of violence, like Mary, like myself, like Catherine Johnson, like Baby Boo Boo, like Kendrick Johnson. And, Georgia. and and so there are people that are victims of this system every day, and we allow ourselves to put blinders on because their stories are not in front of us on Channel 7 or Channel 3. And we allow ourselves to put blinders on because it's convenient and it's easy to say, well, not today. You know, I won't, I won't stand today, or I won't acknowledge this truth today. And so for me, on August 9th, a call went up. And we've heard this call before. August we heard this call 
in May. We heard this call last year when Trayvon Martin was killed. We, and it's about when, when are you gonna answer the call? It, it was about when are we gonna say this is the last line, this is the last step before we move forward with resistance work. And so for me, the movement that has happened that I've been a part of with young people on the front lines has been making sure that we have the agency and the, the um, literacy to be fearless and to be confident in our fearlessness, to be confident to stand on the highway and say, this is my right, following the legacy of Van Rustin and Audre Lorde and Martin Luther King, this is my right to stand in, in resistance of state sanctioned violence. And um, it's been difficult. And uh, you know, I had to uh, actually take uh, off of school, I took a semester off of school because um, trying to figure out this work and where I stand in this work, and then Professor Brown wants me to do something and who and what, and no thank you. Um, and so, and, and that was okay, so I, I, I worked uh, to try to figure out where I stood um, in resistance work. And, still being 20 years old and trying to find myself and trying to figure out uh, where I stand in relation to my identity and my sexual preferences and all of these other things that are going on. So for me, self-care was when I turned 20, I literally just sat in a room with the people that I've loved on and nurtured me um, and have been nurturing me no matter who and what I identified as. And just have a true circle and just exist in that space and uh, really, really, have intimate conversations with those who are um, dedicating their lives to this work because it's a it's the community is, is so welcoming and open and, and we have to figure out our place in that and so um, my self care is, is being okay with where I where where I identify as what my place is and making sure that I'm radically visible in that place and to be radically visible is to be unafraid and to be fearless um, as you yell back as you clap back at the systems that need to oppress us. And so that's been a part of the work and that's been a part of the um, healing solutions for me. All right. You know, I sit here and um, I think about how beautiful it has been for me this year, encountering so much in the face of structural violence. I think about the fact that, you know, there is a 51% chance that before a black man in Atlanta becomes 30, he may become HIV positive. That is just the rate that we have here. And I turned 24 this year, and so I think about what the next six years will look like for me. And I'm planning that in my head and turning the wheels and constantly thinking, what can I do, 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 what can I do? And I think about the ways in which black men in particular <laughs> are continually beat down into this narrow, smaller and smaller box of this is how you can behave. This is how you can express emotions. This is how you can reach out. This is how you can be yourself, but not too much of yourself. When I say Black Lives Matter, I don't just mean that I'm saying that to white folks. I mean that I'm saying that to myself, that my life matters. Everything that I do must be a resistance to that, must be healing. And so this year, this is the first year I feel like I have really established support systems. I, I've been able to cry, <laughs> and I haven't cried in years, y'all. I have not cried in years. This was the first year I was able to cry 
and be held by people, people that I didn't even realize had touched me. Um, God, I mean, I, I feel like there's so many names like even just running through my head right now, even before I came up here. Coffrey said, honey, still your nerves, stand in your truth. I, I'm looking at like Mara Ryan and Georgia State who taught me so much about what it means to be a black gay man and identify as a feminist and release your emotions. I'm thinking about folks like Rick Rush who coddled me at the Evolution Project, surrounded by a bunch of black gay men that I knew may not have been judging me, but they were looking at me like, who is this girl? <laughs> And I'm just thinking about the ways in which we as black people, but particularly black men, and particularly the more feminine expressing black men, are pushed to never be authentic. And so I just wanted to say that as, as we shout Black Lives Matter, we have to mean that from the bottoms of our hearts. Like we really have to mean that. We really have to say that as if our lives depend on it because our lives do depend on it. Right. How can the community take action uh, and enhance our organizing efforts and give our crowd alternatives to, to what you've been seeing and really try to spark some new ideas for us? Um, I don't have new ideas, I have some old ideas. Well, well press them forward, press them forward. And one of the mistakes we made in the earliest days of the epidemic was we let the church off the hook. Yes. organizing where all our aunties and cousins were, where we learned how to eat in public, <laughs> not at mom's table, where we learned how to talk in public, where we learned how to dress, where we learned how to, and, and in some cases, baby, we learned how to be them. Um, <laughs> so I am empowering you, because I'm, I'm going to need to talk to some of your ministers about some of this other stuff. But I'm empowering you to go back to wherever it, it spiritually fed you. And if it's abusive, set up a meeting with the minister and tell them you, you're not going there no more and find another place where it isn't. Because if the police are going to jump on her, I need for you to be spiritually whole. I need for you to know what's on the inside of all these identities that we are fighting for. I need for you to be so grounded, so whole, that you can say angelic troublemaker and smile. That's, that's what I would want for our new, and it's an old idea, that the work comes from inside out. And I treasure the fact that I don't know these young people. I'm jealous of his dress size. But I'm <laughs> and you know what, y'all? I don't have to. We are not in Tuscaloosa. It's not 50, 1950 something. It's 2015 in Atlanta. We can turn it out. But from the inside out this time. <laughs> And, and love each other through it. We don't have to beat each other up every time we're together. That's right. That's right. And if your ex is here with somebody new, let him go, honey. <laughs> Thank you. 
Stop by Georgia Equality and give us a check. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, these are these are some of the, the things that you know we've been showing on and uh, in different um, conversations. I think a lot of it is, and again, it's not nothing new. As uh, Black folks who've been in struggle, we know how to take care of each other, and we know how to you know create infrastructure and create ways in which we make sure we're good. You know, and so I think there's opportunities around um, creating. Um, not just cop watch, but also ways in which we have community. Um, what, do you, what is it, Shumi, you always talking about? Our girl gang? The girl gang on the start? <laughs> to, like, to start watching and protecting our communities. You know what I mean? To be looking out for each other. I think starting off with talking to the neighbors that sit on our streets. Boom, oh. there we go. That's just starting from there. I think there's also a critical opportunity. Atlanta, the police makes a lot of money doing security in the clubs where we go and spend a lot of money and they treat us like shit. Sorry. Uh, but they do. But they do, y'all. And so for folks who are, you know, I haven't been, but there's party promoters in here or people who are, you know, doing things and, and, and having those connections with the police. Actually, we got folks in this room who have been previous, you know, Black Panthers, MXG is in the room. They have amazing curriculum on, on building up, you know, um, on community self-defense programs. I mean, the resources are in this room, y'all. And so we don't need folks to come in and police us. We don't need the police at our clubs. We don't need the police in spaces. Events like this, it's amazing. Ain't no fuzz here, and we good, y'all. And we good. We can take care of each other. Our people know how to get each other. And so I think that's what's really important. If we can find ways, you know, to have different conversations. Because I know it's not just a few folks talking like this, y'all. There's a lot of people. Like, actually, we don't have to call the cops if we really don't want to. We just have to put the work in so we can trust each other enough to have each other back. If we really don't call, we can do something different. Another world is possible, y'all. Sure is. Um, so it's a symptom of being young to not have the answers. Um, and so I'm, as I am embarking on this journey of learning and absorbing and just kind of being a sponge in all the spaces that I'm invited to and I'm a part of, um, it, it's a, almost like a ceaseless thing. Like, what is it? What's the thing? What? What? What's the trick? What's the cure? Like, the white hole got it. Why can't we? What, what is this thing that's going to liberate us? Where is the key for these chains? Where is it? Where is it? Where's like? It, it is almost um, like a you know, the angel on one shoulder, the devil on one shoulder. It's like we just all three of us just talking to each other all the time, and I can't, I can't, you know. Outrun it if I'm asleep. I can't outrun it if I'm awake. If I'm drunk. If I'm like, it's not. There's nothing to do that I can do to outrun this question of like, what can our community do? What can we do? How do we solve this? How do we find the key? Because um, these chains are heavy and they are um, rubbing my ankles bare, and I'm sick of them. I'm so sick. I'm sick of our young women and men who are literally being shot down and hung up and strung up. I'm sick of us being um, afraid of radical visibility. I'm sick. And I'm only I'm only sick of this stuff that I know of. And I'm 20 years old and there's so much more that I don't know about. And that's even more frightening. That there's so many violences and grievances that I have not had. I'm not privy to the knowledge. And it... <sighs> It, it, it's it's got to be a host of things. There has to be a, 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 a smorgasbord of, of um, solutions that we all need to like feast on to, together. And um, for me, it's just like, you know, feed and get fed. Mm -hmm. I'm a poet. We, we sit in circles together and we just, when you see a hurt, you just plug in. You just plug in. like. You, and, and it's about being intimate with one another and, and loving on each other enough to plug in and be um, okay with giving yourself to something in the most holistic way. And so, um, in that in that way, like, what what is your strength? What is the creator or the divine of what you believe in? What is that one thing that you know is your stronghold? Is your pillar? Um, and how can you utilize that 
you know, for the movement, for the for the work of, of raising awareness and giving agency and spreading love. If it's you crochet, how do you you know how do you use that as a tool to dismantle this system? Like if you cook, if you make a bomb ass quiche, make some, make the quiche for the movement. You know what I mean? Like how do we how do we, you know if you put that like, you know, there's some, you know, gender queer babies who need some bomb, some bomb jeans. You know, like, how do we each use our, how do we each use what we know is our thing, like our thing, to dismantle these systems? And it's, and that's what young people are so hung up on. It's like we, a lot of times, you know, you go into the west side of Atlanta, you know, you go to um, Bankhead, you go to Old National, and there's these young people who have these talents but don't know that these talents can be used in mighty ways. There's kids who, who are so innovative because they have never had nothing and they don't know how to use what, what that innovation to be applied to, to really, really uprooting the tree that, that is, is the person over. The wheelchair is um, and, sorry. Um, and so, that that's been that's what I think we we um, we, we can pinpoint and, and start there. Start at the, at the table and, and feed one another and and use what we know what we what we know that we know to um, really do some mighty things. Where are the leaders and, and where's your where are your demands? I, I just need one leader to talk to. <laughs> And folks, folks pushed back on that so hard, like it was the clap back heard around the world. Like big pieces just every single minute were coming out talking about, whoa, what? A leader? I'm sorry, this is not your daddy's movement. I'll say it again, this is not your daddy's movement. Each one of us up here does this work in similar ways but we come from so many different perspectives about how to get this work done, which communities to work with, which tools we will use, which systems we will remain complicit in, and which ones we will not be complicit in. And some of us, we wear suits. That does not necessarily mean that we are about respectability politics. Some of us engage in work with the same churches that have used the abusive language that we have endured for so many years. And some of us turn that language into love. And I say that to reify what my sister Ariel said about our gifts. Like, if we think about this, and we think about the few gifts of many, and the many gifts of few. What does that mean about your role? That means that your role is integral. That means that your role is beautiful. That means that your gifts, your talents, all of it is necessary. I need you to hear that, it is necessary. The work that is being done to teach younger and younger and younger folks how to resist everyday oppression is the work that creates a sustainable movement. It's the work that gets us closer because this will not be done by my lifetime. It will not be done by your lifetime or your lifetime. And so I have to ask, even in this room, I, you know what, some of y'all just don't even believe me. Raise your hand if you are a writer. Raise your hand if you are a dancer. Raise your hand if you do research, if you're an academic. Raise your hand if you know all of the hot entertainment gossip, celebrity news, blah, blah, blah. You stay on the social media, all of that. No, 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 no. And if you have raised your hand so far, leave it up, leave it up. If you've raised your hand so far, leave it up. If you have not raised your hand, shout out to me what it is that you do. Technology. Say it, say it. Keep saying it, what is it? You cook, what is it? Say it. I'm not gonna let you off the hook, say it. Say it, what is it that you do? Because the people in this room do not know it yet. You heal, say that, through yoga. What else? Keep it going. What do you do? Don't let the room fall silent, come on. You sing, what else? 
You pray. What else? Listen. You listen. Thank you. Woo! What else? You show up. Thank you. What else? Self-care. You do self-care. What else? You boost Child care. What else? You boost the movement. You boost the movement. What else? Rice chickens. Anyone need some eggs? <laughs> for these women who do not speak, for those who do not have a voice because they were so terrified, because we are taught to respect fear more than ourselves. We've been taught that silence would save us, but it won't. All right, y'all, y'all give our panelists another hand. Bye. 
introduce our sponsors. We got Duncan. And you'll introduce yourself as you come up. Thank you. Um, Y'all already got the introduction. I am sponsored today <laughs> happily by Georgie Quali, also with uh, Freedom to Marry. Um, one of the, if you didn't know, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear the case. I need for you to clap for that. One of the things the court will want to know, is Georgia ready for marriage equality? Yes! Excuse me, I said is Georgia ready for marriage equality? Yes! I didn't ask if you were ready to get married, that's another question. Okay, so one of the ways we're gonna prove that is I am going to get faith leaders to sign on to a marriage pledge. If you are a spiritual leader, a faith leader, I need to see you today to sign up for this. I'm going to stick around until you do. Um, we will also have, because the next question is harder, are you ready for the backlash? I said, are you ready for the backlash? Not everybody in Georgia wants you to be able to marry who you want to. And one of the ways that they have come up with to get in the way of that is called the Religious Liberties Restoration Act. Our nickname is Religious Refusal Bill. Because what happens if you get to the county clerk and they don't believe you have a right to that certificate? And because of their religious beliefs, they could refuse you. Fire them! <laughs> what happens if a government official doesn't want to give the, the adoption papers to the wrong couple? Okay, y'all, we, we're going to have to fight this one. The nickname is Rifra or the Religious Refusal Bill, so that we call it what it is. Georgia Equality needs your help. We're working in combination with folks you ain't never thought we would work with. There's a really cute Republican. No, my husband is all right, y'all. But there's a really cute Republican working on folks from the far right side, center right. And the business community is fighting. And I, I best believe the folks in this room are going to fight this. Yes. Okay? Yes. GeorgiaEquality.org. GeorgiaEquality.org. And you have a flyer in front of you that's explaining it. Don't leave it here. Don't throw it on the floor. It costs money to put your stuff. Yes. Put it in your pocket. It might save you. Because we're going to get the right to marry. That's going to happen. And they're trying to go around every other way to hurt us every way they can. And yes, you heard about a fire chief who lost his job. Y'all, yes. I'm going to make it real plain because I'm running out of time. He lost his job because he didn't do what his boss said to do. And because he didn't do what was in his contract. He has the right as an American citizen to publish what he wants. Nobody has the right to take that into your job and make it part of something that's against the principles that you were hired under. Amen. What I look like publishing a book about anti-gay stuff and I'm working for Georgia Equality. I think Jeff Graham would ask me to pack my purse up and go on home. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. Okay, so we're going to get in. Marriage equality in Georgia. Y'all somewhat ready for that. But y'all need to be ready for the backlash. Because they're going to come for us every way they can. Thank you so much for having us here. I love Darlene and Craig for feeding us on this morning. And I love Barry Rustin and Audrey Lord. Thank you. 
it's always challenging going up after a wonderful singer, a pastor, someone's rattling off gifts, and then I get to come up here and talk about my wonderful organization. But thank you to Darlene and Craig for allowing us to be in this space and sharing the love and learning that's gone on today. We have absolutely been honored to be able to support this breakfast. This is our first year, but it doesn't mean it'll be our last. So thank you. AARP Georgia continues to strive towards ensuring that all people, and I always have to underline that, all people, all people can age with dignity. Not some people, not those people, not this people, not that person. All people can age with dignity, from preparing to get that big promotion to planning the trip of a lifetime. AARP is always here for you to help turn your dreams into real possibilities, and we want to make sure that we're that source of information for you, and that you understand that you can go to us. I want to see those ticks go up on that website. I want to make sure you're going out to aarp.org backslash pride. It's up 365 days a year. We want to make sure that you're going to get the information that is written and specifically there for everybody to use. In the next year, please look forward to some events that we're going to be having, one that we have just developed. We're going to be in partnership with some people with the health initiative. I don't know if Linda has told those of you that are in the back. But uh, we're going to be working on a caregiving symposium called Caring for You, Caring for Others, trying to work on some of the caregiving needs in the community. And we look forward to seeing all of you there. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Hillary Thomas and I'm with AARP Georgia here in the state office and I am around. There's some cards and flyers and information out there on the table if you want some information. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Gabriel and this is Patrick. Um, we're with the Georgia State Schools Coalition. Um, we're super excited to be here. Absolutely. We're excited to be here. Um, we're super excited about the work that we do um, in the schools and ensuring that, that there's a safe space for all of our young people. And in three weeks, we have an exciting event that Patrick's going to tell us about. Yeah, and um, in three weeks, we're doing our GSA Summit, which is it's a group of a bunch of youth, up to 300 came last year, and we're expecting more this year. Uh, the goal is to educate them more on uh, this year, our focus is uh, health and about health initiatives in the LGBT community. I'm sure all of you are aware of the lack of information available in our public schools and to our, to our youth, and that's something that we're really looking to combat this year um, and to really make a difference. Uh, we, of course, are looking for everyone to come out and to join us, and uh, we are looking for volunteers and for people who are willing to be speakers uh, to really help inform youth. Uh, you know, as we talked about, Lack of education is one of the biggest things we fight, and that's something we want to make a difference on. And, uh, you can join us on Facebook as well, and uh, uh, you can also go to the Georgia Safe Schools website uh, to learn more about the coalition and the GSA Summit. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Timothy Webb, and I have... Hey, family. <laughs> I'm Rick Rush. Um, today we stand here to say thank you. Well, first of all, I want to give a thank you to Craig Washington for asking me to be a part of this. I'm so excited. I'm so happy to be a part of this. Thank you so much. I've actually been attending the breakfast since I moved here three years ago. And I was just wondering how can I give back with my resources, and he let me know exactly how we can do that. Um, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation is a global organization that provides cutting-edge medication along with advocacy. We have about 357,000 people in 36 countries. Um, we were founded in 1986, and we are the largest provider of HIV medication in the United States. And there's a local chapter under AIDS Healthcare Foundation called Impulse Group Atlanta. I'm the director of marketing for that, and we are a social advocacy chapter-based organization. And the thing that I just want to put into the space briefly. <laughs> Number one, there is a scientific well, there's a scientific fact that energy is not created nor destroyed, but recycled. And I stand here as that recycled energy of my murdered brother, Femme, and my fallen sister, Butch. And as I look across this room, we all are a part of that story. The story that started with Baron Russell and Audrey Lord continues to manifest in us. And I just want all of us to know, continue to take action regardless of what your fight is. Because at the end of the day, it is the story that will outlive us and the story that will heal us and sustain us. So thank you. Good afternoon, how are y'all doing? Good. Good afternoon, how are y'all doing? Because y'all get ready to go to the streets and make some noise, so I just want everybody to be awake. 
Uh, my name is Buck Cook, and I'm privileged to serve as the executive director of Atlanta Pride. And I think this is my sixth or seventh year volunteering for the Biogress on Arby Lord Breakfast. And I just want to thank um, the planning committee for letting Atlanta Pride be a sponsor again this year. Dr. Martin Luther King said that our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. And one of my favorite quotes from Audre Lorde is a quote that spoke to me a lot as I was getting ready to come out, and that quote is, your silence will not protect you. And as we heard about a few minutes ago, as we gain more and more rights, and more and more equality, and more and more inclusion, our detractors and our opponents are going to become more vocal, and frankly, probably even more violent. And so we have to be ready for the challenge that's going to become coming our way. Um, we are proud to be one of the oldest LGBTQ organizations in Georgia. This year we are celebrating 45 years of pride in Atlanta, um, so we are excited about the anniversary and look for a lot of different things that are um, coming our way. One of those first ones is if people can hold up the Our Founding Valentine's flyers. Um, if you didn't get one of those, please grab one of those as you leave. On February 12th, we'll be honoring some LGBTQ pioneers in our local community, some of whom have been in this room, but they may not have been notified yet. So exciting things coming some of your ways. Um, please come out to that event. Um, there will be some donations for that event, but it is free for folks to attend. We have some upcoming events we want you to be aware of. We have a faith and family discussion March 5th, and we are very excited about a couple of events we're doing at the end of March. We're bringing in Sam Brenton, who is um, a nuclear engineer by trade, but he is a, uh, a conversion therapy survivor, and he is an activist to have conversion therapy you know, classified as torture and is non-medically um, proven. And he actually testified before the UN uh, subcommittee on that issue in November in the UN passed a resolution um, declaring that um, conversion therapy is torture. And so on March 28th, we will bring, be bringing him and a singer songwriter named Dustin Utley to be doing a workshop called You Can't Change What We Never Chose, a discussion on the ex-gay movement and conversion therapy. And then that evening in my sister's room, we'll be doing a Trevor Project benefit concert and all the proceeds be going to the Trevor Project um, because they are an important organization doing important work around um, suicide prevention and LGBTQ teens. So we are very excited about those. Other events coming up as well, if you go to AtlantaPride.org, click on our events tab. And of course, come see us for the festival, October 10th and 11th at the Piedmont Park. Thank you so much and have a great march. Good afternoon, y'all. I'm Brandon Patterson. I'm with the Human Rights Campaign. I serve on the Board of Governors. And this is Molly Simmons. I serve on Human Rights Campaign's Board of Directors. And um, we're here um, as sponsors for the Human Rights Campaign. So Human Rights Campaign is a grassroots civil rights organization, and uh, most of our work that we do is um, volunteer-based. And so we have a number of volunteers throughout the state of Georgia and Atlanta, and uh, many of whom are here volunteering with us today. Um, we do have initiatives through um, the HRC Foundation that seeks to enhance the lives of LGBT persons um, and increase those through inclusive policies and practices and institutions such as churches, schools, workplace, and hospitals. Um, the HRC Youth Campus Engagement Program works to create an empowered youth and in um, several years we've had the foundation serve um, a day of service and uh, that's towards homeless youth. And Molly's going to speak more about our national and our local um, organization. So Human Rights Campaign, or HRC, is a national organization, like Brandon said. We have 20 communities across the U.S. who um, are having an HRC MLK Day of Service um, either this weekend or today. Um, HRC sees this day of service as a way to transform Dr. King's life and teachings into community action. Um, so that we can help bring together people, build community, and meet national challenges. So this year we worked with Lost and Found Youth. I don't know how many of you all have heard about this organization that serves homeless youth. Um, Forty percent of LG of the um, youth. Um, Homeless and at-risk youth are LGBT. So 40% of the youth that are out on the streets um, identify as LGBT. So we decided to partner with them. We did a clothing drive, and we got not just clothing, but um, also some um, toiletries and gift cards and things that Lost and Found needed. Um, nationally, HRC is uh, co-presenting a conference next month in Portland called Time to Thrive. And this conference is geared toward youth-serving professionals um, to build awareness and cultural competency and to try to gather resources from experts in promoting safety and inclusion and well-being for LGBT youth everywhere. So we've taken, as an organization, we have taken apart Dr. King's statement that life's most persistent and urgent question is, 
what are you doing for others? And we appreciate your letting us take a couple of minutes to tell you what we're doing. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amir, and this is Bridget, and we are I have two particular programs that I want to share with y'all about uh, this afternoon. Um, and one is, one is our Community Health Fund. That fund is an emergency fund for individuals that identify as LGBTQ here in the state of Georgia that are underinsured or uninsured. So if you know someone that needs medication assistance, prescription help, et cetera, et cetera, by all means send them our way. We have a table outside and it has our contact information on it. Um, Another opportunity that's available for folks that need it is that we're going to have health screenings in the community over the next couple of months, one of which in February will be for trans and gender non-conforming people. So if you know people without insurance or need uh, a safe place to come to ask health questions, by all means keep us in mind. And now I'm going to let Bridget talk about more programs. Hello everyone, we're almost done, we promise. Um, we wanted to give you some information really quickly about the Affordable Care Act. The Health Initiative is a free resource for the community. If you have any questions about getting health care under the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, whatever you refer to it as, we are the free resource for the LGBT community here in Georgia. So it doesn't have to be here in Atlanta, anywhere in the state of Georgia. Amir is on my team. Um, we have Alejandro, who's a native Spanish speaker, and we have a team of volunteer CACs who are here and we're a resource. We actually we have four of us here today. Please, if you haven't had the chance, come talk to us. We want to make sure that everyone here, if they have any questions, February 15th is a very important deadline. That's when open enrollment ends for 2015. So unless you have something really unique happen, that's when you have to have it. So February 15th, we still have time. Some people think the deadline passed. That is not true. Um, our, health, our website is thehealthinitiative.org. The the is there, so it's thehealthinitiative.org. Again, we have a table out there. Amir's there, I'm there, so it's going to be fun time. And if you have a chance, come talk to us before you head out to the march. Thanks, guys. <laughs> hey, good afternoon. Happy Movement Monday. Hey. So my name is Everett Thompson. I have the pleasure to uh, serve um, at the Racial Justice Action Center. I work for a campaign called Solutions Not Punishment. How many folks in the room know about Solutions Not Punishment Coalition? Thank you. Solutions Not Punishment Coalition was founded in 2013. And Solution Not Punishment Coalition is because of everyone, mostly individuals in this room and organizations who continue to push for justice for trans and gender non-conforming people. A lot of our work is to fight back on the profiling and harassment of trans and gender non-conforming people as they walk the streets just so they can actually survive. Um, in 2013, or two years ago, SNAPCO was formed and co-anchored by the Racial Justice Action Center, Legender Inc., and Transforming. Within this time, we will witness some amazing victories. These victories, again, would not be possible if all of us didn't come together. So I want to just talk about a couple of things that we've done, and I say we, because we've done these things together. One, we defeated the advancement ordinance in Atlanta. And when I say the advancement ordinance in Atlanta, that's right, this is when the city of Atlanta decided that um, trans and gender non-performing people, particularly trans women, could not walk the streets in, a, in downtown or midtown Atlanta because they might be doing sex work. And the city, uh, the city council went to say, push them out. And so we, with the trans community, particularly the trans community, because we believe that it is impacted people who can lead our struggles to freedom. And so the trans community came together and fought back with our allies. So that's one. Two. Um, we exposed the Midtown Power Security Alliance and their hatred, racist, transphobic attitudes against trans and gender non-conforming people. We pressured MARTA to say all of us should be able to ride with respect, be it trans or otherwise. We also pushed back on the East Point Police Department where they decided that they should take someone, a trans man, pull them aside the road, and threaten them with a general search. We showed up in 104 to say no, not on our watch. And then last week, last Thursday, we showed up as a community to push back on the Atlanta Police Department to say we need standard operating procedures written by us, with us, so that the uh, Atlanta Police Department know how to treat trans and gender non-conforming folks. We know that the fight is not done. We know that we're going to continue to push back uh, with the Atlanta City Council, with any in Fulton County. We know we need services, not sentences. We need jobs and not jails. We need housing. We need things that make it so that we can survive and thrive, not just be. So we ask you to come see us, 
join us. We can't do this alone. We are Solutions Not Punishment Coalition. We are trans-led, trans-centered, but we are a coalition of beautiful people. And we ask you to be with us on this journey. Until we are all free, we say thank you. Have y'all had a good day today? Yes. Has this been everything you thought it would be? Yes. Okay then. So that we can continue this work, y'all already know you have to give. But I need you to complete those evaluations. Done. Already done? Yes. Okay. How many of y'all want to help us get this done next year? Oh, yeah. Here we're volunteers. We're going to meet at the Rush Center on the 11th, February the 11th. At six o'clock, Rush Center. Would you put that in your calendars now? Six o'clock at the Rush Center. Tweet us, send in your pictures, Instagram us, do all that kind of stuff. Go to our Facebook page and like us. It don't make no sense. We got 500 people in here and we got 500 likes. I should have a thousand by now. Like us, okay? And for the people who are participating in the march, we have signs out and we're going to give some direction. I'm going to come to Share that. Again, thank you all so much, Dr. Bridges. Patty Stein, I think she's already gone. I just appreciate everybody for being here. Another, again, to all the volunteers, thank you. And volunteers, before you leave, if y'all go in that kids' room, make sure all that stuff get packed up real good, because it just needs to be done. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to call up. We have, a, we have a special token of appreciation. Uh, Common Brown. I'm J.D. Bailey, and I uh, volunteer at Common Ground Ministries. And you know, through the years, I thank God for Craig Washington and Darlene for what they have done. They're a while we're here today. You know, we talk about Martin Luther King having a dream. Somebody dream. I know Craig dreamed. And there's two calligraphy, uh, these were personally calligraphized by an artist by the name of Sharon and Smith. And they can fight over which one they want. But I want them to have these to remind themselves when they get tired, they get worn, because they do. Look at these or look at something and remember the dream that y'all started. freedom to the caged. Suppressed and enraged, depressed and outraged, assimilated and assuaged. What is life? What is life? What is life to a Negro? Home to a Latino, respect to a redskin, rights to a homo, homo sapien. That's right, men, we're talking. Uh, what is white? What is privilege to a white man? That's right, men, we're talking injustice and race again. It's in your face again, and it's black and it's ugly, and it's here, and a little bit queer. Maybe it's the bald one in me that just cannot not give up, wants to proudly run amok and shake it up, wake it up, as there are those out there who like to make it up, aiming to assassinate my culture and ruin my good name. My James wants to seek them, read them, and teach them, send them back from whence they came. My Malcolm, my Malcolm wants to show them it's not a game. He wants to burn this house down and build a game, a new, a fresh. He doesn't want to go back to the drawing board, but wants to pen a new sketch to create a better picture. My, Ma my Martin, silently searching for scripture, ministers to motivate and evoke dreams, demonstrates peace and persistence, yet hardly ever screams. And though my Stokely similarly once increased, he can't bear another speech. 
He would rather hit the streets. No justice, no peace, no justice, no peace with our pieces. Boldly breaking the chains in our leases that act like leashes. My NWA rebelliously raps at the police's militarized state authority. Uh, this is my thesis. It's time to reform this conformity, humanize this humanity, divorce individualism, ego, and vanity, to reclaim our sanity. In 79, Karanga recommended unity for a sacred community without impunity, subject to being shot down in the street and left to bleed out for the world to see that strange fruit still exists and is, and is ripe and is sweet. My Larry Lamont Walker will not admit defeat, though in many ways he's been defeated. Will not take in any more hegemony, though these days he's depleted. And will not retreat until his mission is completed. This is my post Du Boisian plight to challenge apathy towards black and brown life. And if, I, and if I execute it efficiently, if I did my job right, you thought twice. But if not, then good night. Thank you. Now go march. Thank you.